Hey, everybody. Welcome to Mailing It, the official podcast of the United States Postal Service. I'm your co-host, Dale Parsan. And I'm Jonathan Castillo. You're in for a real treat this episode. Dale and I talk with our guests about the vital role the Postal Service plays in everyday life. Of course, people have email and social media and so many other ways to communicate these days, but mail continues to be deeply ingrained in our way of life. Now, imagine a time when U.S. mail was the only way to communicate over long distances in this country. Taking that a step further, imagine a time when this country was at war with itself and the only way to keep in touch with your loved ones was by writing and receiving letters. That's right, Jonathan. This episode, we're going to talk about the power of letter writing and the importance of the Postal Service during the U.S. Civil War. We're also going to hear from a Civil War soldier and his family about their firsthand experiences during the war through letters they exchanged at that time. Here to guide us on what I'm sure will be a fascinating conversation are Lynn Heidelbaugh and Thomas Peone. Lynn is the curator of the Smithsonian National Postal Museum's History Department, which specializes in telling the history of the U.S. Postal Service. And Tom is a Civil War historian and a museum specialist at the Smithsonian Institution National Air and Space Museum. Lynn and Tom are also the editors of Between Home and the Front, Civil War Letters of the Walters Family, a book that chronicles in much greater detail the lives of Private David Walters of the 5th Indiana Cavalry and his wife, Rachel. Tom, welcome to Mailing It. And Lynn, welcome back to the podcast. Great to be here. Nice to meet you, Jonathan, and see you, Dale. It's good to be here as well. Wonderful. Before we talk about these amazing letters and the stories they tell, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourselves? Lynn, you've been on the podcast a few times already to talk about the history of the zip code and about military mail. For those who may have missed those conversations, tell us a little bit about your background and the work you do at the Postal Museum. I am one of the curators at the Smithsonian's National Post Museum, where I joined um, in 2004, specializing in collections and research about the history of the Postal Service, and I have specialized in military mail and letter writing culture. Um, that results in uh, articles, um, essays, and um, exhibitions. So I've done exhibitions from topics ranging from women's uh, military service during World War I, the history of military mail, and also the U.S. Postal Inspection Service. Tom, you're new to the podcast. Tell us about your connection with the Postal Museum and what else you do at the Smithsonian. So I actually started my career at the Smithsonian in 2009 as an intern at the Postal Museum. And uh, Lynn allowed me to work on this project because I had a background in uh, Civil War era studies and Civil War history. So that is when I was able to really dig down into these letters and realize just how much amazing history uh, were contained in the missives between uh, this family. Uh, but I now work at the National Air and Space Museum as the curator for the Lighter Than Air collection, which includes blimps, balloons, and airships. And I actually curate the, some fabric from Civil War balloons. So I still have that Civil War connection even at the Air and Space Museum. So just as a personal note, uh, so are you at the one in D.C. or are you at the Udvar Hazy? Uh, so technically it's the same museum. Um, oh. It's one museum, two locations because we're spoiled. <laughs> um, and because we have really big things that don't fit on the mall, that's really what it is. Gotcha. Uh, so I am technically downtown is my main duty location, uh, but most of my collection is actually at Hazi. So. Oh, wonderful! Oh, is it pronounced Hazi? Uh, yes, Udvar Hazi is Udvar the gentleman. Hazi. He's the gentleman that gave the the very large check to pay for a majority of the building. <laughs> so better get that name. Well, it's a pleasure to have you on the podcast. Thank you so much. It's so great to be here. So it's it's interesting how letters can serve as candid historical documents. They tell you not only about the people writing and receiving those letters, but also about the times in which they lived. What makes the Civil War such an interesting period to study in terms of letter writing? And why did you choose these letters in particular? Well, you're right. The letter writing seems like a novelty to most of us today. Um, and a lot of people don't realize that years ago, this is the main way that people were communicating over long distances. Um, and it's our goal with this collection of letters to help people understand how they are important historical documents, that they help you understand a time pe period, people's mindsets, 
their social interactions. These are social relationships that are developing and being sustained in these letters. But um, we also really want people to understand how this was significant primary communication modes for decades, if not really centuries. And it, we um, really see this at times of war, where people are, of course, motivated to write because they're separated, that there is honestly that specter of death. Um, and so you do want to say everything that you can uh, in your letters. So that many of them can be revealing at times of conflict, um, in times where people are facing danger, where families are fi hoping to find hope within the letters and dreading to receive a last letter. Uh, and so during the Civil War, uh, Americans were really motivated to, to stay in touch because for many, this is the first time they're separated from family members. And of course, there's the, the strife that they're facing, whether they're in battle or, or at home um, and facing all new circumstances economically and socially. And these letters, uh, for the first time, have become truly affordable for most Americans. Um, after postal regulation changes in the 1840s and 1850s, more Americans could now write and send letters than ever before. Um, and then with the invention of the or acceptance of the postage stamp in 1847, it really became very easy to drop a letter at the post office and send it to someone. You know, sometimes it's hard to for me to fathom, right? Obviously, I'm preparing for this podcast, and I'm, I'm looking forward to speaking with you guys and getting deeper into this. But I mean, I in this day and age, I get upset when somebody doesn't get back to me by, you know, later that night when I text them in the morning, much less having to wait, you know, days, if not weeks to hear back in correspondence. So, uh, Tom, was there anything else you wanted to add? Yes, the that is actually a very good point about that that delay. And you, you actually see that uh, come up in the letters. Uh, as, as Lynn mentioned, this became the only way for families that were separated by war to communicate. So a letter became a, a critical aspect of, of morale for both soldiers and those at home. This was the only way they were learning what was happening at home or how, how their soldier was doing in the field. Uh, so these became, uh, critical for, for kind of both sides of that. Uh, and as a result of that, you can really gather a lot of information. Uh, at that level, at the very personal level about what, what was going on and how the war was impacting everyone. Uh, so that, that just made it even more important to, uh, to have these letters and to be able to, to read the information in them. I think a big part of why they're even around today, Tom, is they become treasured, right? You know that somebody took the time to grab a, a writing utensil. Don't even know if it's right to call it a pen, but, you know, a quill and ink, let's say, and actually pen something. You can see their handwriting. You can see the effort they put into it, a tremble in the hand as you're reading through it. And they end up holding on to them for such a long period of time. It's um, really happy they did. Absolutely. Especially for historians, we... Uh, we're able to to glean so much information out of them that you don't normally see in kind of top level views of history. So you've both chosen a handful of excerpts from actual letters to share with us to you know provide real world examples of what we're talking about, right? Those letters are part of a larger collection in your book, Between Home and the Front, Civil War Letters of the Walters Family. Could you set the scene for us? Who are we going to hear from and who are they writing to? Yeah, so Tom and I selected excerpts from uh, six of the letters from this Indiana family. And uh, all the letters uh, from this family exchange from about 1859 to 1868 are in the collection of the Smithsonian National Post and Museum and transcribed in the book. Um, so we're going to give you a, a sample today. Um, as you mentioned earlier, uh, these are letters m between Private David Walters of the 5th Indiana Cavalry and his wife, Rachel. And the final letter is actually from uh, David's brother, Isaac. Uh, David's letters, they were um, of his own personality. Uh, they were about being a soldier. Uh, he also very freely expressed his love for the family and missing them. Uh, where Rachel's letters were recording how she was getting on at the home front, managing things, uh, taking on the job as a teacher, and raising their young son, Willie. She also was exchanging all the information of other family members. She became the hub of communication for David and his brothers, uh, Isaac and John Wesley, who were also serving in Indiana regiments. So this first pair of letters that 
we're going to be hearing a uh, date from 1862, and they're between uh, David and Rachel. Uh, Rachel's letter is written in mid-November, November 12th, and then David's response is written on Christmas Day, 1862. Rachel's letter to David, dated November 12th, 1862. You say you have some notion of joining the regulars if I will let you. Now, David, as you want to know my mind on it, I will give it. David, I would not have you to join the regulars for anything. We do not any of us want you to join them. Phoebe says to tell you she says no twice, for we want you to come home as soon as you can. It has not been quite four weeks since I saw you, and it seems to me like four months. Oh, the time seems so long. I can hardly wait. David's Response Dated Christmas Day, 1862 This is Christmas and a droll one it is to what I'm used to. It's warm and raining. The boys are enjoying themselves very well, laying around in their respective tents, some riding, some telling fish stories. There's no regular soldiers here except our company. There's about 1,500 home guard and legions in this county. They're fully organized and ready to turn out at any call. We expect to have something to do before long as the secesh is getting quite saucy. They're beginning to act about as they did last summer before Morgan come in. They say that they are looking for a heavy secesh force thrown in before long. Please write as often as you can. Take good care of yourself and child. Rachel's letter that we've just heard highlights uh, a point of friction. It's those needs on the home front and keeping family together, a marriage together, um, and businesses and farm going. And against the demands of the milita- military's necessity and um, that draw of patriotic duty, which uh, David has expressed to her in a letter. She is responding directly to one of David's recent letters in which he floated by the idea of joining the regular U.S. Army. Uh, David had been a, a volunteer, and if he had switched, it would have meant a much longer term of enlistment. So to make her point, she brings in both her sister Phoebe's um, commentary uh, as a powerful reminder of those family obligations. She also goes to the heart of the matter about that separation and missing David when she talks about the time of not seeing him for several weeks. And he had only just volunteered. Um, He had started in the summer of 1862 and gone into training in September. So in those early days, he has that desire to further his commitment to the Union cause. And he's clearly adjusting to military life and considering that longer term enlistment with the Army. So Rachel's reminder uh, that there's a home and there's a family and there's her and their marriage to come back to um, is clearly what she's trying to uh, bring his attention to. And she wraps up um, these notes also with tales of their son Willie's latest antics and the games he was playing and makes one final uh, entreaty to David in this letter to please don't en- enlist further. David's response letter uh, describes where he is and uh, goes into some detail uh, about the condition of the camp, and he you know specifically mentions the weather. Uh, again, he's he's trying to explain to Rachel what he's experiencing what, while he is away from her. Um, he also brings up the what the company is doing for Christmas, and this this most likely was his first Christmas away from home. So he he even uses the word "droll" to kind of describe the the rainy you know the rainy uh, weather and and sitting around camp again without his family. So you can really see this uh, this feeling coming out of of what he is experiencing and how how he's not enjoying it at the moment. Uh, he also mentions something about the there's no regular soldiers uh, in the area except his our company. You know, he says our company. This uh, reflects that. His unit is the uh, only kind of volunteer force in the area as opposed to uh, militias or or local uh, forces. So they're really there helping to uh, keep order. And it kind of he's he's explaining a little more how their unit's a little more organized than some of the things that are around some of the other units that are around. 
And in our research, we uh, we never found him going beyond this volunteer status. So uh, we believe he did listen to his wife's advice and, <laughs> oh. and, and stayed as a volunteer. Well, that's probably good. And, and frankly, when you're away from home, it's not just about necessarily feeling guilt and being reminded of your responsibilities, but it's also just nice to have that moment to break away and to think back to particularly what he may be fighting for, you know, a future for his family. I thought it was really interesting about, uh, you know, the, the abbreviations that they were already making, like the success, right? And uh, <laughs> saucy. I thought those were interesting word choices. There. Maybe we should bring them back, Jonathan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Let's make it real. So uh, based on your research, is there anything about these letters that's unusual for the time in terms of the way people wrote or how they express themselves? Well, thinking about uh, Rachel's letter, I'll, I'll talk about um, her a little bit more. Um, she really is following the style and the conventions of the day. Um, she uses phrases that were in etiquette books. Um, but looking at the material which we, we got to work with in the collection, her letters are uh, bright, vivid blue ink. And so this seems to be her personal preference, and they really stand out. And she has a kind of perfect penmanship, which you would expect from a teacher, which she is. Um, but what is extraordinary is that we actually have her letters. Um, it's unusual to have the home front letters because of the demands uh, on soldiers, sailors, and Marines of constantly moving, being in danger, perhaps having to burn their letters before going into battle because they don't want it to fall into enemy hands or somebody else to read them because they're private memories. But we do know that somehow David um, saved these. And um, through careful reading of the letters, we believe that they were returned to Rachel from a comrade. David's writing is much more difficult to decipher than Rachel's. Uh, he most likely had a less formal education, and uh, that, that shows through both how he wrote and then uh, some of his grammatical and, and uh, spelling errors that appear, uh, including uh, spelling different camp names or cities differently in various letters. Uh, however, you do see his letter writing uh, technique and just things, uh, his style change over time. So as he is doing this more uh, brought on by necessity of war, he, he is improving uh, as the war goes on. However, uh, we do note some of the letters appear in a completely different hand uh, in the collection. So we believe that he may have been dictating to a comrade to write a letter for him at times, which was not uncommon, especially for people who uh, had never written before or had less uh, formal education to, to do so. And because of this, it actually really helps to read some of the letters out loud uh, because of there's because of the lack of a standard uh, formatting or spelling, uh, sometimes reading out loud can, can give you a hint as to the word that is trying to be spelled or trying to be written out. Well, I mean, I guess they didn't have a uh, spell check back in the day, so. That's right. No, That's don't right. tell me. <laughs> I'm curious about what it was like to send and receive mail during the war for families like the Walters. How was mail service affected by the fighting? How quickly could you expect the mail to be delivered? Well, for uh, those on the home front in the Union, it was um, pretty much uh, mail as usual. Um, most of the time would be uh, timely deliveries, uh, but it also, it really depended on where your family member was uh, deployed. Were they on a campaign, um, and that's a little bit harder for the post office department to reach them. And even in one of David's letters, he mentions that uh, the letter could not be sent to his unit at a certain time because they were out in the field. They also do also have to tell them who to send it to. So he was usually putting at the bottom of his letters, here's my commanding officer's name, and that's who it was going in care of. So there was those little kind of uh, signs of addresses are even different. Um, but for the most part, the post office department and the military coordinated all the shipments uh, to the troops. They coordinated um, some of the processing and times to exchange the mail. And they could reach mail to someone within a day or two for some of the letters that we have between Rachel and David, but it could also take weeks to months depending on the circumstances. Did the Army give soldiers paper and encourage them to write? Uh, did they worry about soldiers giving away too much information in their letters uh, in case the mail was ever intercepted? You know, I'm thinking plans, locations, stuff like that. Paper and envelopes and stamps were not issued to soldiers by uh, either Army. 
uh, that was something they had to get uh, on their own or, or through other means. So uh, oftentimes soldiers would buy the materials needed to write home from uh, traveling uh, merchants that were called sutlers. Uh, so they would carry stocks of paper and, and pencils and, and ink and things like that. Uh, there were also several volunteer organizations, especially in the north, that would provide such uh, paper and, and really encouraged uh, letter writing. So organizations like the U.S. Sanitary Commission and the U.S. Christian Commission were uh, very much encouraged soldiers to write home, again, seeing the value of this for morale and for you know keeping both sides, uh, the home front and the, the soldiers uh, involved and, and, and knowing what was going on. Uh, they also very typically re- requested these items from home. Uh, there are specific mentions in the letters that Rachel writes of her saying, I sent you stamps or I sent you paper. Please continue to write me. So uh, that was a very typical request that many soldiers made back home of I'm out of stamps or I'm out of paper. Please send so as soon as you can. Yeah. Now, now when I send a care package, it's usually socks and snacks. <laughs> Back in the day, it was stamps and writing utensils. That's right. Gosh. And those stamps were um, really important because uh, it was very hard for the post office department to get those stocks of stamps out to the field. Uh, there's tales of local post offices if a uh, unit had just moved in and wanted to <laughs> kind of start sending those letters, they would totally clean out that post office of its stamps. So in 1861, the post office department allowed soldiers to uh, just write on their letter the the phrase soldier's letter. And they were supposed to have it um, franked by their commanding officer. And that meant that the letter could travel without a stamp but it meant that the recipient had to pay it um, once they got it um, at home. So it's a little different than what we know today for the military mail where there's free mail in conflict zones. I feel like uh, if I'm receiving a letter, I'd be happy to pay it, though. Yes. And and (laughs) these are almost like little gifts, too, when you have somebody paying that stamp for you. Yeah, when you're waiting, you know, two or three months to get that mail in, you know, I'll I'll gladly pay that. Exactly. Give it here. (laughs) So what? Tell us about what we're going to hear in the next two excerpts. This is from a couple of letters between David and Rachel in 1864. So first you'll hear from David's letter to Rachel, dated April 26. And then we'll hear Rachel's response, dated May 3. So for those following along, we fast forwarded about two years, right? That's right. And um, there's a lot of... uh, a lot going on in 1864 during the Civil War, and um, they are they are writing about it at this point. David's letter to Rachel, dated April 26th, 1864. Tis with much pleasure that I improve the present by writing these few lines this day. Find me well, hoping you are the same. I think the pictures are very nice. I would not know Willie, but yours is very handsome. If you had been standing and your hat on, it would have suited me better. But it is nice enough. You spoke about having wet feet. My dear, have you went to teaching school without getting you a pair of boots? If you have, it grieves me very much. If you have not got money enough to make you comfortable, let me know by the return of mail and I will spare you some. Rachel's response, dated May 3rd, 1864. I walked to Star City last night after school and was well paid for my trip, for I received two letters and two small books or tracts from you. I have read them all and think they are very nice, my dear. If it was not for the good and kind letters that I received from you, it seems to me that I never could stand it. I am glad that you have received the miniatures, for I was afraid that you never would get them. Please tell me in your next letter whether you know a young man in your company by the name of Corbett, and whether you know what become of him. Mrs. Macaulay told me that his folks had not heard from him for some time. They thought that he had been taken prisoner, but they had not heard from him for so long that they did not know what had become of him, and I told her that I would write and ask you. We hear a lot about that aspect of of her being an operator, right, trying to relay those messages. And it, you know, it comes off, at least from the listening, that, you know, it feels as though she's, in order to maximize the space, maximize the amount of time, she's foregoing her one-on-one time with David in order to help the community. And that's that's kind of beautiful. 
yeah, the this uh, her role that she kind of adopts of being this hub of communication uh, is essential to the family. Again, she's relaying information from multiple brothers who are in different theaters of war back to one another, and then including information from the home front, from what's going on at home to them. And so she really does play this critical role in, in keeping the family together, even though they are spread out as far as they possibly could at this time. <laughs> what else can you tell us, Tom, from what we just heard? So in this exchange, you uh, you hear a much more emotional side of David as compared to kind of our first excerpt. And uh, he specifically mentions receiving pictures uh, from her, uh, which the, is sometimes referred to as miniatures, but uh, phot- photography had been uh, you know, increasing in this time. So being able to get a photo, uh, and uh, it was often printed on glass or tin, uh, that, and then being able to send it back and forth became a, a very important aspect to many. Again, just having something to remind you of <laughs> your spouse away was was an incredible gift. Uh, so he he really highlights this and and, and explains how happy he is to have, have received it. However, his concern for what's going on at home is is still the same. Uh, he, you know, this discussion with with getting a new pair of boots refers to a conversation in which she said she had uh, gone teaching and come home from, with wet feet, and he's he's very distraught about that. He even mentions, "If you need more money, please let me know." I, you know, he wants her to be comfortable. So, even though he has been, uh, you know, away from from home for so long, his concern for her and her well being has only increased and, and is still very much uh, in his mind. I really like this uh, new side that we're seeing here from David. You know, he, he's very much a, a charmer, this David, you know, <laughs> very handsome. I like that photo. <laughs> right. So absolutely different side. Well, we've got two more excerpts. Uh, tell us about those. These two are probably the most significant of the excerpts in terms of both this uh, family's history, these individuals, and also um, one of them about uh, gives us insight into the nation's history. Um, The first is from May 1864. Rachel writes to David on the same days that he is actually in the Battle of Resaca, which is in northern Georgia, and he is ultimately taken prisoner of war on one of those days. The second letter was written uh, nearly a year later, and it's written to Rachel from Isaac Walters, one of David's brothers, and he was a private with the 20th Indiana Infantry. The date of Isaac's letter is April 17, 1865, so that's just three days after Lincoln's assassination and eight days after the Union General Ulysses S. Grant accepted Confederate General Robert Lee's surrender at Appomattox Courthouse in Virginia. Rachel's Letter to David, May 1864 I again seat myself in order to answer your very kind and ever-welcome letter of May 9th, which came to hand yesterday evening and was gladly received and read with much satisfaction. It found me well, and I hope that this may find you enjoying the same blessing of health. Willie is well. He is very well pleased to see me come home. He always runs to meet me. He says that he is Ma's boy and Pa's boy, too. He says that his Pa is down in Dixie fighting rebels. And I asked him what he thought that Pa would fetch him when he came home, and he said he thought that Pa would fetch him some little boots. The war news are more favorable than ever now. They all think that war cannot last much longer. For my part, I certainly hope that it will not. There has been two hard battles in Virginia lately. Isaac Walters' Letter to Rachel, April 1865 It has pleased the Almighty to spare my life and bring me safely through the last struggle. While many have breathed their last on the field of battle and in their horrible prisons in the South, which I think is the worst of all deaths, I would ten times rather be killed in battle than die there in filth and dirt with starvation. But alas, for my poor brother who has fallen a victim to their cruel hands, Oh, what a sickening thought that such a near friend should perish in such a way, and such a place as one of those southern prisons are represented to be. Yesterday, we received intelligence that Abe Lincoln, Secretary Seward, and his son were all assassinated. This is awful if true, but I hope it is not. If this is true, it is very likely we will be held five or six months longer than we would have been. Otherwise, I close for the present, hoping soon to get an answer. Rachel's letter, it's full of details of her life as a busy mother with that um, beautiful passage about young Willie and uh, 
his um, experiences at the war as a as a little boy um, of just a few years old. And also that life that she's leading as a school teacher where she has to balance everything and she's returning home to Willie. Um, she's so busy that she has to break off this letter while writing it on May 14th to help uh, with the farm and go into the fields. And then she returns the next day on May 15th and continues the letter. But there's while she's writing this over two days, she has no way of knowing, knowing that at the same time that David is also in battle over those two days. Um, and she wraps up this letter, again without knowing, um, with a message of hoping to promise to write more often, to send David uh, some more stamps so he can write often too. And so these are the things that she doesn't know as a writer. And uh, we know um, as a reader and knowing the history and um, having to know that David's personal history and that history of that battle, what, what comes. But you can imagine what it would be like for her to be writing this with a quite a sunny disposition that she has and then finding out the news later. Isaac, his, in his response, uh, you know, his, you can, you can see the emotion that he is experiencing uh, as, as the war is, is coming to a conclusion um, and he's realizing, you know, what his family has paid uh, during this conflict. Uh, he specifically mentions uh, receiving news of uh, his brother's death in a POW camp and, and uh, has quite a long, uh, you know, uh, uh, opinion of, of what that must have been like. And again, you really see this, this emotion coming through that as, as he comes to grips with this reality. Uh, it's, it's also interesting that he, specifically mentions, you know, a pivotal event in American history with the uh, the assassination of Abraham Lincoln and then the attempted assassination of uh, Secretary Seward and his son. So we know that he actually survived. But at this time, uh, this was the information that Isaac had. So he he's realizing how how um, critical this is going to be and that this will most likely, in fact, extend his service. So it's really a reality check for him. He's realizing that even though the war is was wrapping up his time in the service is not over yet because of the the events that are going on around him. I'm going to be honest that it, it it got me a little bit. I'm uh there's a little mist in my eyes. That is heartbreaking and just a testament to how powerful these letters really can be. Yeah, I was going to mention the exact same thing, Dale. I, I felt like I went through an emotional roller coaster just reading the optimism, um, you know in Rachel's letters um, talking about their son and he's hoping to get a pair of boots and then to just get hit with Isaac's letter. Oh my gosh. As a father, it's just, it's heartbreaking, you know? And this is why it's so important to have these letters going because th th this is the way they got the information. This is the way they expressed their, their grief, but also their hopes um, for many, many returned like Isaac. Um, but the reality is those who didn't, some have the letters, um, some have the photos left to their family members. Heartbreaking. That's a fascinating story. And the way it's told through letters in the words of the people who lived through it makes the story even more incredible. Before we let you both go, I'm curious if there was anything in these letters that surprised you or if you had any challenges trying to decipher the meaning of anything David, Rachel, or... Isaac was writing about. For me, it was getting into these conversations. Some of these letters were uh, a couple of days apart or a day apart. They were responding directly to questions. It was like you could hear their voices. Um, and these were letters that they would have shared with other family members passing along that information. Uh, but to start to see how they related to each other is unique because there are so few letters from the home front. So to have Rachel's letters and her experiences, her perspectives, and being able to then talk about her brother's in law's letters and tell her husband about where they are because he might not be receiving their letters is such a, a special source. Um, and for I'm sure for the the family that held on to these for years but also uh, for us as historians to understand what it meant to exchange letters at this time. I was always struck by how much information uh, you could find in, in these letters, you know, that, that uh, many times when we study history, we, we have a very high level view of things because it's, you know, we can't possibly know everything unless we spend 
many, many years <laughs> studying a subject. So yeah. having a high level understanding is, is, you know, what we can expect to have. But in these letters, they're, they're writing about things that are directly impacting their individual lives and, and all these very, um, uh, these lesser known aspects of the war are, are you, can, you know, are drawn out through these conversations, as Lynn said. Uh, Rachel describes uh, things that are happening at the home front and uh, resistance to the draft and things like that. And then uh, David discusses his participation in, in, in certain uh, battles and areas that are, are not as well covered as others, uh, especially in the middle of the country, uh, something called Morgan's Raid that is just as not as known as other major battles. So just reading through these letters, you can get these these little details and these facts that are, are not necessarily lost to history, but just are not as well known. And you can really see how this this war that impacted the whole country impacted individuals and impacted their lives. And, and you know, it really gives you uh, such an appreciation for, for, for how much this upended everything in the country. Lynn, Tom, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, I have to say this was probably one of the more emotional podcasts that we've had to date. It, it definitely got me a little misty eyed, but it was well worth it. Absolutely. Thank you both for joining us. I 100% with, <laughs> with Dale on that one. I, I, you almost had me going. Thank you for the opportunity to share these letters. They're extraordinary. Absolutely. We, they impacted our lives as we worked with them, and we were so grateful we could share them with others. It's now time for another Did You Know, where we discuss interesting facts that most people probably haven't heard about the Postal Service. I'll get things started. Dale. Did you know that the longest serving postmaster held their position for 74 years? Did they start from birth? (laughs) Well, public service did run in the family. Roswell Beardsley, whose father served in the New York State Senate, began as postmaster of North Lansing, New York in 1828. He was just 18 years old at the time, and he held on to the title of postmaster until his death in 1902 at the age of 93. Beardsley was well-loved by the patrons he served at the post office in his small country store, including some families whom he served for five generations. That is, I can't even fathom that, five generations. All right, that's, that's truly a man of the people. I'm curious, though, did anyone else come close? Well, we've had several postmasters who served for more than 60 years most recently of which was Edgar Cumley, who was the postmaster of the Reddick, South Dakota Post Office for nearly 66 years until his retirement in early 2015. While inspiring is uh, the easiest way I can put that. My Did You Know also deals with some postal business. Think about the adhesive stamps we all know, need, and love. Mm, What about them? Well, did you know that before 1847, there were no general issue adhesive stamps in the United States? Surprisingly, it was a private New York City delivery service, Alexander M. Greig, City Dispatch Post, that issued the first adhesive postage stamps. That was back on February 1st, 1842. The U.S. Post Office Department quickly bought Greig's business and continued the use of adhesive stamps for carrier service in New York City. Remember, there was no free delivery to homes and businesses back then. Wait. So how did people pay for postage before? Well, previously, you'd take your letters to a post office where the postmaster, clerk, or assistant would note the postage in the upper right-hand corner. From there, you had three options. Pay the postage in advance, have the person receiving your letter pay for postage when the letter arrived, or split the cost between sender and recipient. That changed once prepayment of postage became mandatory in 1855. Sounds like a headache compared with today's process. What did the first U.S. posted stamps look like? The first stamps came in two denominations, a five-cent stamp with Benjamin Franklin and the ten-cent stamp with George Washington. Thomas Jefferson and Andrew Jackson stamps followed years later. Very cool. All these postage stamps were printed on large sheets with pre-gummed backing and had to be cut apart with scissors until stamp manufacturers began perforating sheets of stamps. That wraps up this edition of Did You Know?
Jonathan, we had a wonderful conversation today learning about a side of the Civil War and the involvement of the Postal Service that, frankly, I had never really learned about. Absolutely. Uh, I just keep thinking about something that Tom had said earlier about how all these details that we get through the letters really help give context and make all these events that we know about, you know, kind of top level. Yeah, that you, know, you learn about in school. That you learn about in school, <laughs> right. And and now you get to, you know, internalize it. You make it, it's more personal and it gives more context to what you're, you know, reading about. So I really like that part. Absolutely. And it's and honestly, to me, it's just amazing that we still have these letters. You know, Lynn was talking about how sometimes these letters just didn't make it. They didn't make it back from the field. And the fact that we have them and we're able to get that glimpse is it's really just remarkable. 100%. All right. That wraps up this episode of Mailing It. Don't forget to subscribe to Mailing It wherever you get your podcast to make sure you don't miss the next episode. And follow along on Instagram at US Postal Service, Twitter at USPS, and on Facebook.